Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 671. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's July 2nd, 2021. All right, welcome to Casual Friday. Yes, I have my dress shirt on. This is my dress polo shirt that I always wear for each episode. But George, you look like you're wearing a, a grease mechanics jumpsuit there. Yes, I am. I've got one of my mechanics overalls on. Um, we don't have a sextant at our church. Everything's done by volunteers. And that's wonderful because in January, February, March, we've got 10 guys all willing to get out there with power mi- ro- uh, power machines sure. and mowers and cutters and tools. And July, June, they're all gone. <laughs> and the rainy season started 10 days ago, which means things are growing uh, as oh, fast sure. as possible. So I was out here about 7 a.m. with my machete and my boots and uh, clearing a path to the church through the brush as I hear the monkeys and the parrots cockle in the background. And, oh, boy. Well, we just really... After the- we relocated here to Pittsburgh, where the campground just south of Pittsburgh, and most of the license plates are Florida. So yeah, you're, the people who are mowing your lawn are up here. That's right. Uh, except the people who are still here. I, we celebrated my birthday at coffee hour last week, mm-hmm. and we have a lot of people with Parkinson's. And sure. as they walk back to their table with their cake, they're yeah. checking their plates and everything. Crumbs on the floor. And and all the crumbs are on the floor and then everybody walks on the crumbs so after uh, this show i've got to go steam clean that carpet so the cake's still getting pushed into the uh, maple syrup from sure tuesday and the corned beef juice from st patrick's day and all the things that wind up on parish carpet floors now you should always have a clean floor for july 4th weekend absolutely uh somewhere here for the mustard from the mustard stains and the ketchup stains yes. and the, that's right. Uh, potato salad. That's going to be the big stain. Um, let's see. Episode 671. We got like six or seven different topics. It'll be a good show. Before we get too far into our show, we need you to like the show on Facebook or YouTube. That's free advertising for us. We don't want to pay for advertising, and you don't want us to pay for advertising. That's just a waste of money. Please share this episode with your friends, family, and enemies. Love your enemies. If you really love your enemies, you'll send them a link to our show. Uh, you guys are great commenters. I've just discussed this before. You're probably the, the most polite commenters are, <laughs> of any YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed yet, please subscribe. And if you don't want to sit down at your computer and watch two guys talk about Anglican news, you can listen to us. We have a podcast. You'll find that link in the show notes. Um, let's talk about stuff that happens over across the pond. Uh, we're Anglican Unscripted. We get to talk about things that are Anglic, Anglican, which means of England. Uh, we have a new deadly sin. A uh, bishop there has declared that uh, uh, he is more worried about people not social distancing than he is about a politician and being caught in adultery. And I thought we could talk about that because that's interesting. People wonder why the Church of England is dead vacant and nobody cares anymore it's comments like these george well in the united states we had uh, jack spong uh trying to rewrite the bible and uh, tell us you know christianity for a new modern age and bishop david walker of manchester is also rewriting the bible to paul's injunctions and romans uh, ahead of adulterers and fornicators and all this and that we now have the topic of social distance violators Matt Hancock is a government minister of some sort in the uh, Boris Johnson government, and he was caught on closed circuit TV having a bit of a fling and affair with a woman staffer. Now Hancock is married and has three children, and his staffer is married and has three children. And so when this adultery took took uh, took the tabloids by storm, a wonderful story. What the British tabloids, the red tops, live for. Then David Walker, the Bishop of Manchester, sticks his oar in and says he wasn't concerned about, quote, a bit of a fling. He was more concerned about their not social distancing. Now, Kevin, I'm known for making stupid jokes, jokes that only my father and I thought were funny. My wife constantly tells me not to be stupid because this is the sort of joke that you would make 
because you know two people committing adultery the sin is not that they were committing adultery but to commit the adultery they had to violate social distancing you know that's a dumb joke it, absolutely he was serious yes, he was <laughs> he was serious i mean and um, this is forwarded to us in a, in a headline and i'm my first language is sarcasm i thought for sure he was just being sarcastic but when you look into it, he was deadly serious. I hate deadly serious, but he was deadly serious. I mean, this is something that I would, like, Norm MacDonald used to do uh, the weekend update on yeah. Saturday Night Live. Yeah. It's the last time I watched the show, so it's aging me. I don't know, 10, 20 years ago? 30. This is the le- you know, 30 years ago. At least I didn't say uh, Chevy Chase and Jane it's- Curtin. <laughs> uh, but the... Uh, this is a level of sarcasm and dumb joke. It's humorous to say that the problem is not adultery. It's violating the latest government edicts and mandates. But Walker's serious, and it reflects a mindset that we have in the Church of England. Uh, we used to call it Erastianism, where the basically the government runs the church. The, the secular civil authorities sort of wag the tail of the church dog. Today, there's not even any uh, any pretense that it is not so, except in this case, it's the liberal Democrats and the left wing of labor wagging the tail of the Church of England of the most inane, asinine comments. Now, if you ever look at a picture of David Walker, man's not a beauty. Now, Kevin and I are not uh, people that are going to be subject to oil paintings anytime soon. This guy looks like Spike Milligan after a long weekend binge. You know, he's got one of these fuzzy beards. He's cadaverously thin, white hair, big black eyebrows. He's not an attractive fellow. And so to have him being the face of the Church of England uh, and then saying something that anybody with half a brain, after they get over the shock that it's not a joke, would think, what is this guy on about? Um... Next story, and I know this. I, I've done this. I have been known in the past to pad my resume with adjectives. With <laughs> Kevin, usually you and I pad other things. Yes, right. Stomach, <laughs> There's my, much padding. My and so, you know, you, you, when you're selling yourself, you, well, you want to really sound good, and like you know what you're talking about. And if they haven't thought of it, you've done it already. You know, you have every skill they're looking for and many skills beyond. And that's the the idea of resume is to let people know who you really are. Um, sometimes you want to be a little uh, less honest about your age. Now, I've never, you know, I'm getting close to the, what I want to lie about my age <laughs> ever since I turned 40. But uh, we have a bishop who uh, didn't just pad his resume, but he... Uh, was dishonest about his age, and he was uh, uh, certainly, uh, we reported this before, uh, in Uganda, he lied, he got caught, he got fired, and then he said, well, what else could I do? I could sue. In in the great Episcopal Church uh, fashion, he sued the diocese. Now we have the results, George. There's, it's a, a minor level scandal in Uganda, but also speaks to the state of the Anglican world and let, let me explain what's going on. Charles Kumi was elected by the House of Bishops of the Church. Charles Okunya was elected Bishop of Kumi mm-hmm. in Uganda by the House of Bishops in 2019. And the House of Bishops selects among the candidates, and the candidates fill out these applications, and they make sworn statements as to the veracity of what they have said. Church of Uganda canons say that the minimum age for bishop is 45, they must retire after 15 years or upon reaching the age of 65. No wiggle room. And so he was elected. But then people wrote to the Archbishop, Stanley and Tagala, saying, you know, check this guy's marriage out. It may not be as what it should be. He may have cheated on the side. Well, Stanley and Tagali sent a letter asking for a response from Charles Acuna. And then the bishop's uh, committee went and examined all the files again. And then somebody compared document A to document B. Here's the attestation saying I'm 45 years of age. But here's my baptismal certificate. 
here's my school certificate, here's my driver's license, here's my birth certificate. Let's do the math. He's not 45. And so they stopped right there. They didn't look into any of the other complaints and said, I'm sorry, your election is void ab initio, void from the beginning. We're not even going to look at uh, claims, whether they're true or not, of immoral conduct. Y you're out. And because you lied, you may never stand for election as bishop again. Well, Acuna sued. And on Wednesday, I think it was this week, the high court in Kampala ruled the bishops do the right thing. Now, that's the story level. What's the, the moral of the story? This is the second time in less than a year that the Church of Uganda has shown itself to be straight and true and upright and obeying its canons and not bending them to meet and match the needs of the times. We had the whole Stanley and Tagala saga of adultery and where he was brought out by the Archbishop uh, Stephen Kazimba and we went through all this grief from Africans, Ugandans, telling us you shouldn't embarrass Stanley like that. Even though he did something bad, it's worse to talk about it than the actual sin. The Church of Uganda did not hush this up, did not say, okay, well, we'll just keep you on ice for two years till you reach 45. They did the right thing from the beginning. And you contrast it the way the Church of England works, or the Episcopal Church works, or the Anglican Church of Canada, where if you are uh, in the favored party, you can break any rule you want. Tom Shaw, Bishop of Massachusetts, he can marry gay people left and right when it's against the church rules, no problem. Bill Love, I don't agree with a resolution of general convention, out the door you go. Uh, you know, it's one rule for us, the other rule for them. The Ugandans have once again shown the moral integrity and moral maturity of how a church should be. Mm -hmm. but we're in a different we're in a different world, Kevin, where, you know, for so for how many hundreds of years did we look to the United States or to England for moral leadership on the world stage? Well, we don't get it. It's not in national affairs and now not in church affairs. We get it from other places. Yeah. Um e even the ACNA has has suffered a little bit this week. Uh we post a story uh from the diocese of the Upper Midwest, a statement from uh, Bishop Stuart Ruck, uh, saying, listen, we, we probably blew, blew it. There's been uh, some allegations on social media, and here's the whole story. And he laid out uh, what has happened so far, where they are in this independent investigation, and, you know, that Bishop admits we didn't follow through like we should have followed through. And that's where things really start to... to to bite you we've seen this in the episcopal church we've seen this in every denomination especially the roman catholic church where there's kind of a set of rules when uh something happens uh certainly you know, in this case uh, sexual misconduct there are rules that the diocese must follow there are rules that uh the civil authorities must follow and there's rules uh, that the uh the church itself must follow and whenever you kind of miss one of those steps it comes back to bite you, and I, I think this story is, uh, at least for a short period of time, going to bite the Diocese of the Upper Midwest, uh, because you can't assume that uh, civil penalties and, and uh, civil judeans is good enough. Uh, let, let, let me give some background, uh, sure. without naming names, because uh, this is still under litigation. Sure. A lay minister a lay catechist, a lay church leader, more than just a lay person, somebody who had a position of responsibility in the uh, Christ Our Light Anglican Church in Illinois. An uh, un unpaid volunteer. Unpaid volunteer. He is alleged to have sexually assaulted a parishioner. Uh, the woman has gone on to uh, Twitter, uh, social media, to pro to post allegations, pictures, this and that. And she has told her story. And the essential story is that she was ignored because this fellow was being groomed to enter the ministry eventually. And he either had some sort of close relationship or whatever. 
And finally, it was taken seriously after he was arrested by the police, when the police, either on this or in another charge having to do with children, found there was credible evidence to arrest him and investigate claims of it's called rape, but legally, technically, it may not be. It may be indecent exposure. It may be sexual harassment. I don't know. And I don't want to make that the point in which the story ends. The story is that the diocesan staff dropped the ball, leaving Bishop Ruck to take the blame, essentially, because he's the man at the top of the totem pole. And they didn't really do what they should have done. It was basically their first time with such a thing. And this is and they didn't do it as well as they could have. They didn't they didn't cover up. They didn't hide it. But they want they came in with a very naive attitude um, that they prejudged the, from my reading of it's my reading. Of this is story. early in, yes. <laughs> it looks like they prejudged the case rather than just go by the book. Mm -hmm. Just like the Church of Uganda went by the book, the Diocese of the Upper Midwest should have gone by the book and Bishop Rook wouldn't be embarrassed by a screw up by his people. Mm -hmm. And this has prompted uh, some women clergy of the ACNA to release a public letter asking, you know, uh, lamenting and offering support to the survivors of abuse. A good the letter. Diocese of yeah. the Upper Midwest. Very appropriate. And all, you know, let me just say, because we're fallen, broken sins, we're going to have these problems everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's no denomination, there's no group of people uh, that is safe from this. Um, the, the mark is how well you measure it. And I guess what we have found, experience has taught us, is to give as little discretion to the people at the bottom of the process and just make sure it all goes, and, in other words, Oh, this woman's a nut, nut job. I know whatever his name is, Phil, Fred, Jerry, Barney. He wouldn't do this mm -hmm. and le let it go at that. You can't do that. No, they're, they're predators. You just can't do that. And we have seen that there are people out there who are predators, who groom victims. Um, and now, after this first report, two, three, four of the people have come forward and said, yes, he did this to me as well, or I've had... Uh, I was in, in a, a lady came and said she was in a, a multiple month affair with the same individual. And so, you know, you can't make these assumptions. He was arrested. He was put in jail. It took him six months to make bail. And the assumption was, we'll just let the civil um, judicial process work. And we just wash our hands as a church. And that's, from what I can tell, that's where the mistake was made. In this last week, we have we have had something from the other extreme, mm -hmm. which is the Bill Cosby case. For yeah. those who don't know, Pennsylvania Supreme Court threw out Bill Cosby's conviction. And they were right to do so. Yeah. Because if you read the record, there was prosecutorial misconduct. Bruce, in 2005, uh, the DA in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, Bruce Castor, who was one of President Trump's uh, attorneys at the... Uh, uh, impeachment, second one, Bruce Castor. I went to summer camp with him, by the way. He's our age. <laughs> so, uh, Thank, thanks for bringing us into this. You know, <laughs> you know. Okay, Bruce Castor. You know, had the complaint in 2005 when he was DA, and he did not have enough evidence to go. And he suggested to the victim sue him in civil court. And if we tell Bill Cosby we will not proceed on these criminal allegations, he can then not revoke, evoke invoke. his right to yeah. invoke his right to self, uh, the Fifth Amendment rights yeah. for, you know, you can't. And so this woman won three or four million dollars in a civil judgment because they knew, Castor knew he didn't have a case. Well, uh, Castor was a Republican, they got a Democrat DA elected a few years later. And he decides to go for another bite at the apple, and he revokes the agreement and uses the testimony in the civil trial, which was protected by the by the prosecutor's agreement. And then they had one trial, and that still was not enough to convict Bill Cosby. It was a hung jury, because it just was a he said, she said. 
And then the district attorney came back a second time and brought in five additional women to testify about different things. And then he was convicted. Now, that's not right. You can't use other bad acts to convict on, you know, just because you did something bad here and there, you can't be convicted on this for having done that. Well, the courts convicted him and Cosby's been in jail for three years going through the system. And finally, the Supreme Court says, look, this has been a travesty. The DA, you shouldn't have even started this. There are plenty of other operations. You had five other women testify against Cosby. Pursue those cases. Yeah. You, but, but now the statute of limitations has passed. It's over. And here we've got an overzealous prosecutor screwing things up by not following the system. And here we have Upper Midwest being underzealous, screwing things up by not following the system. Yeah, it, there's a, it's a difficult situation to be in, especially, you know, the ACNAs uh, uh, finally hits maturity. It's older than 10 years old. But, uh, you know, you, there's a process. There's a reason a process. The reason there is a process is because people have not followed the process previously. Uh, i.e. the Roman Catholic Church, i.e. the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, every denomination has come up against us. And so next time, if when this happens, just step back. Should I follow through? Yes, please follow through. And that way you don't end up on the pages of Anglican Inc. You don't, you know, um, and th there's no hurt feelings. Everybody knows you're, you're trying your earnest. And you don't have to say the buck stops here at the top and I'm sorry. You know. Well, we must, we must commend the Diocese of the Upper Midwest by their transparency mm -hmm. at this stage of the process. Yeah, absolutely. I will say, I'm going to pet peeve here, pet peeve here from George. I called and contacted them before they put out their statement. And they said, hold on, hold on, hold on. We'll send you the statement. Hold on. Give it a day. We really need to do work on this. And so I didn't run with the woman's accusations. And then I get, we'll send something to you tonight didn't come and late that night i get an email from kevin saying have you seen this <laughs> they published it on the diocesan website but never sent me a copy we uh, are humble journalists george we're not gonna let this slight us okay you know oh well, yeah there's plenty of other stuff out there to keep us busy but come on guys you know that's not how the game's played it just shows how they're they just don't know how to do this they're Wait. so new with this thank god they don't know how to do <laughs> thank god this is the first crisis th this diocese has had okay thank god i mean i we had a, a story that it's an exclusive to anglican inc uh where the senior vice president of the church insurance company is suing the church pension group uh for uh reasons that we don't know because it's under a sealed uh indi sealed uh under seal it's ABC versus DEF in the New York Federal Court. And I found out about it, and I wrote to the church pension fund, and they gave me an answer that, you know, immediately about uh, this case, uh, which we don't know anything about because the uh, church pension fund was able to get the judge to put it under seal, Well, meaning and, we can't see the proceedings. And if any church understands how to be sued and how to sue, it is the Episcopal Church. So you're talking the diocese of the um, Bishop Rux diocese, the least experience in this, thank God, to the Episcopal Church, the most experienced in legal ease. Oh my God! Well, he, he, just to compare, they were able to get the judge to seal the complaint, gag order on all the uh, uh, gag order on the, the plaintiff's claims, which eventually, mm -hmm. essentially, are that he helped. Uh, cover up. There was a cover up of massive losses in the pension fund, which should be a major story if it's true. Yeah. But the, he got the judge, the church got the judge to gag everybody. And then they gave a disclaimer saying, This is a former, disgruntled former employee, and there's no merit in his complaints, and it will be just, and we will prevail in court. Beautiful, beautiful <laughs> press handling. Not yeah. terrible for me. No. But they did it perfectly. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully. You know, he becomes a whistleblower, and we hear more about it. But uh, uh, that's that's the news business, you know. That that's the news business. Uh, we are down to our last story, unless we can come up with make up some own, our own news in our heads. Gafcon says they're going to meet face to face uh, with the primates in September. Uh, that'll be an interesting story because 
we just had the year of COVID. They met via Zoom, uh, which everybody has. What is the future now for GAFCON in light that Lambeth is going to pick up? Who's going to attend Lambeth? Uh, GAFCON is certainly, you know, a, a strong force now within the Anglican Communion. So much so that other provinces are rumored to join the team. So, yeah. Ben Kwashi, the uh, general secretary of GAFCON, announced on one of their prayer bulletins that come out over email each day or every other day that the primates haven't been able to gather for two years because of COVID. They've had some Zoom meetings, but that really doesn't work well uh, for this group of people. And they're hoping to get together in September of this year for their first person to person meeting. We may see some new pri faces at the meeting. Uh, the new primate of uh, Pakistan's uh, Azad Marshall. He helped organize the uh, GAFCON meeting for those who, under their country's laws, are not allowed to visit Israel when we had the Jerusalem GAFCON meeting. Um, so he, he may be even a part of the new team. Um, we may see some, you know, developments here and there. There's a uh, new, uh, new guy in West Africa and things of that nature. So we'll see how things develop. Now, uh, what are the, and I think the thing is on the agenda is what are they gonna do about Lambeth 2022? By that time, the Living Love and Faith initiative will be out. And my guess, reading the tea leaves, it will be confusing and a fudge. But let's sort of stand back a second. This week, the British Methodist Church approved same-sex weddings. The British Methodist Church is in talks with the Church of England to mutually recognize everybody and everything, and just like we, the Episcopal Judge, does with the ELCA, and uh, the ACNA does with, uh, what's that other Lutheran? The other Lutherans. <laughs> <laughs> the conservative Lutherans. We get the crazy Lutherans, you get the conservative, you get the good Lutherans. You're looking for the Missouri Senate Lutherans. Uh, well, them, but not so much them, but the other ones that broke away from the ELCA. They've uh, got a yeah. professor. Okay, we're just insulted. All of our Lutheran <laughs> viewers. Like, my apologies. I'm sorry. <laughs> there needs now, to be a Lutheran unscripted. <laughs> now, what's going to happen if they do go through? Because these people love these agreements, you know. A Church of England couple can go to the Methodist Church and get married and then come back to the Church of England and say, we've got a lawful church wedding. Uh, Church of England clergy who are in civil partnerships can get a Methodist marriage and come back and say, we've got a religious marriage here. And I think that the lack of pushback from the Church of England is a bit of a hint because they're going to go ahead with the reunion with the Methodists eventually. The lack of pushback on this point from the Church of England either means they're asleep at the wheel, which is possible, or this is going to be the direction the Church of England is going. So really, it's no great concern of theirs that the Methodists are jumping, jumping ahead of them. Because remember, the Scottish Episcopal Church has already gone there. So the primates, when they gather in September, have to ask themselves, what do we do? Do we remain on the defensive? Do we go on the offensive? Do we push back hard against Welby? Now, if they go on the offensive, that means they all go to Lambeth and take the show over by a force of numbers. Do they remain on the defensive and continue in the, the years of interminable, you know, well beizing, uh, divide and conquer? Um, don't know. Don't know what they have on their agenda. They have experience on their side. Uh, the last two and three Lambus are the experience of how the Church of England sees uh, African provinces and Southeast provinces and, and Asian provinces. They don't view you on the same level as them. There's not you, you're not meeting amongst equals here. They want to control the agenda. They want to uh, control the outcome of Lambeth, and they want it to be a meeting of peace, love, and happiness, and maybe film a Coke commercial at the end. That is the desire of Lambeth. Now, the desire of uh, Gafcon and uh, so many other provinces is to seek the future of the church to save the future of the church to save the lost in the world it, it, it's a different agenda there and using the experience of the past 
knowing the um, ways the people who put together Lambeth have controlled the agenda, I think now would be a great opportunity to go in there when they're a week after COVID uh, to take over Lambeth and uh, get what you want voted in, uh, get a different selection for the uh, um, Canterbury, and you have to see what happens. Uh, I would not give up on um, the Church of England, but the Church of England is not the future of the Anglican Communion in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you have the ability with Lambeth to do what you want. If you want to just separate, just have Gaffin, that's fine too. But I think now is the time uh, after COVID to really go into Gafcon and, and lay out your agenda and retake the Anglican Communion, at least one of the instruments of unity. You're absolutely right, Kevin. Um, the Global South, Gafcon, can dictate the terms of uh, this situation, mm -hmm. this battle, if they come and show up and act in unison, mm -hmm. if they trust the Archbishop of Canterbury, or they won't, they will, history shows that they'll be rolled. If they walk away, the Archbishop of Canterbury will seize and with the left run all the institutions and they'll be forever on defensive. The best defense is a good offense. Mm -hmm. I know that's hackneyed cliche, but there is that opportunity to settle things, to really push home the point about what is the Christian faith and what is not the Christian faith. What is acceptable behavior by a bishop? What is not acceptable behavior by a bishop? And the constant defensive maneuverings and fear that, oh, if I do this, then this will hurt me in my pocket or this will hurt me politically you know this is the opportunity don't blow it yeah well we'll have to see what happens now kevin and i as reporter or kevin and i george I'm, I, I, it's friday i don't even know who i am george and i <laughs> as reporters you know we'll just report what happens but you know we've seen uh how this works we see that this is an opportunity for gafcon if you don't show you don't show but this could be a chance to go in there and, and blow the lid off one of the instruments of unity uh, once and for all and retake the Anglican Communion and then work in the other two instruments or just dissolve I, them. I just, I just want to share one little sure. thing that the, the no-show viewpoint has two things. One, that's from a Western perspective and another from, a, from an African perspective or traditionalist perspective. From the African or traditionalist perspective, we don't sit down with people like this whom we don't regard as being decent or fair people. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that argument. Then we have the sort of Western perspective is that if we have a walkout, we'll make a statement and we'll basically ruin the proceedings where, you know, this past year, the Democrats in the Texas state legislature walked out of the session so there wasn't a quorum so that the governor was not able to get all his key signature bills uh, signed into law. That's a technique that worked. Absence worked. Lambeth doesn't have quorum rules. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. And there can only be three people there, and the voice and the mind of the Anglican bishops are what those three people say. Don't be. Don't allow your cultural blinkers to defeat defeat you ahead of the battle. I, I'd also like to note that uh, the press isn't going to be showing up like they did before. As far as the press is concerned, the Western press, uh, the Anglican Communion is liberal enough for them. And, you know, uh, when they look to what's a good example of Anglicanism, the Church of England, and they're fine with that. Uh, so I would not worry. The BBC will show up because they have to film it. But other than that, you're not going to have the big press that you had 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Well, actually, or, or 20 years ago, especially 10 years ago. Um, but actually, that's a bonus for Kevin and me. Yes. Because Kevin can sell B-roll B to networks who want to have a 10-second spot. Uh, you know, I was asked by the Washington Post to cover the last general convention of the Episcopal Church because they couldn't be bothered to send anybody. Yeah. And... Uh, Hey, that's great for me. Money in our pockets, but uh, it defeats your ultimate ambition. Aim. It does. All right. Well, that is casual Friday. We got one. Oh, we got, got one, one more thing. So, oh, what is uh, Just a tiny follow-up on the Bishop of Winchester. Oh, sure. 
the uh, Bishop of Winchester, as we reported, stepped back, quote unquote, for six weeks. And that was to end on Wednesday of this week. On Wednesday, the acting bishop, Debbie Sullen, who is the Bishop of Southampton, suffragan of the Diocese of Winchester, said that the talks are still ongoing and Bishop Tim is going to step back until the end of August. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that, uh, I, well, it tells me, and uh, that Tim Dakin has basically put his spikes on and he's not going without a fight. Don't. He still think. In other words, he didn't go quietly in the night. This is the first time in church Church of England history that this has happened, and he didn't go quietly. He didn't basically fold his tent and go away. He's put his spikes down and is negotiating. Or because we're past the face saving point, it's past. Oh, I have to care for my sick mother and need to retire. Um, you know, all the polite fictions by ex by pushing the time are lost and it'll basically be i don't think he can come back because he doesn't have the confidence of the diocese but he doesn't know that these these are brits they fight hard i'm kevin carlson i'm george conger you've been watching episode 600 and oh, 71 i think 71 of anglican on script